Здравейте, this is how we say hello in Bulgaria. Welcome to the recursive podcast. I'm here today with my guest, Eva Gumnishka, uh, who will be telling us more about how a person turns from a human rights activist into a social entrepreneur. Eva, thank you for being on our podcast today. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. All right, now we have a blitz round. Um, you can answer with a few words or a sentence. Uh, you can finish the, the sentence to your liking. I help refugees because... This is my way of tackling a really big geopolitical injustice and trying to help people who are suffering because of that. Entrepreneurship is like... It's like being completely independent and doing um, whatever you want to do and without being uh, dependent on, on anybody else who dictates uh, your priorities or your goals. Autonomous? Yeah. The quality that I value the most in people that I work with is? Reliability. Sarah Blakely generates ideas while driving around, around Atlanta. Uh, what is your secret to your creativity? Um, showers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my personal hero is? My mom. The book that I turn to when I most need advice is? I'm not sure there is such a book. I am not a person who refers to books for advice, maybe for other things. Who do you turn to for advice then? Oh, my husband. <laughs> He's kind of the, the brain behind everything that I do, the, the main counselor. My mission is? I don't know yet. In searching. Yeah, to <laughs> um, be determined. To be determined. Do you have a favorite quote? Not that I can think of, no. What I love the most about our corner of Europe is? That the future is still unwritten and there is so much potential. Your story is uh, quite an interesting one. Uh, you went abroad for your studies. You went to the university in Granada and then went to Columbia University. Um, can you tell us more why did you choose foreign universities for your studies? Yeah, well, I actually did my entire undergrad at Columbia. Granada was just like a year abroad, um, which was basically done so that I could be together with my boyfriend, who was at the, there at that time. Uh, so it was all, you know, personal reasons. But Granada was amazing. It was a great uh, breath of fresh air after spending so much time in New York. Um, why I did it? Um, you know, coming from Bulgaria was always so exciting for me to uh, go abroad, discover, see new places. Um, and, you know, uh, the Ivy League had always had like a certain attraction uh, as for every high schooler, you know, um, and anybody basically. Uh, so, yeah, when I was given the chance, I, I had to choose between several universities and I chose Columbia. I've always wondered what it would have been like, you know, if I had chosen another one. But, you know, the attraction of, of Columbia, New York, that was uh, just, you know, something that I couldn't resist. Nevertheless, you moved back from New York and the States uh, to innovate the way Bulgarians is dealing with the refugees. Um, why did this particular issue spark your creativity? Well, I actually left Bulgaria in 2013, uh, exactly when the whole uh, refugee crisis, as it was known, uh, was happening in Bulgaria. So I was coming back during the summer. I was witnessing, you know, a, a little bit of what was happening. Um, and it was very strange for me, you know, living abroad to be witnessing how Bulgaria was handling the whole thing, uh, how the media was portraying it, how the society was thinking about refugees and migrants, uh, how they were being treated at the border. Um, so, yeah, I was really interested in just coming back immediately after I graduated and, and trying to do something about it. I actually had never thought that I wanted, would go back to Bulgaria after graduating. I always wanted to, like, go around the world and discover places. And, uh, you know, I had always been in love with Latin America. So I was like, oh, this is the place for me. I'm never going back home. Uh, but then, yeah, in, in my last year at university, I was just, like, very inspired 
by the opportunity uh, and the, the big need that there was for doing something in Bulgaria and, and helping to address the issue. And I had also become quite critical of human rights activists who are going to like other countries and trying to fix other people's problems. So in the end, I decided, okay, let's just go back home, try to fix things where I'm from and, and where I know the environment, where I can navigate it, where it wouldn't be like a foreigner coming and trying to impose a certain standard of what um, you know society should look like. Uh, it would be mostly me just working from within and, and trying to fix things. Mostly people going back with no experience whatsoever are turned to NGOs and other ways of uh, making an impact. What unlocked your entrepreneurial spirit? Was there a particular situation or? I think it was just the desire for independence, you know, because I, I knew that I wanted to create something with a social impact. Um, but creating an NGO would mean that we would have to be dependent on grants, on um, donations or any other type of funding. And, uh, you know, that wasn't easy to, um, to secure, uh, especially, you know, for such a controversial topics like refugees and migrants mm -hmm. in Bulgaria. And, you know, the other reason was that I wanted this to be sustainable. You know, I didn't want it to be to depend on external financing. I wanted it to work on its own and to be independent. So that was it. Basically, I didn't start with any big desire for like earning a lot of money and, and having a glamorous exit and then becoming like a, a serial entrepreneur or whatever. I just wanted whatever I'm working on to be sustainable. So this is how you found uh, Humans in the Loop. Can you tell us a story about a person, a refugee, that you help through um, working with humans in the loop? Yeah, sure. Well, in the beginning, we started with a very small team of people who are working for uh, full time. Uh, and most of them were Syrians or Iraqis here in Bulgaria. And we still work with uh, a lot of them, actually, but more on a freelance basis. And it's great because um, in the beginning, they were earning very minimum full-time wages just because we weren't able to afford paying very high salaries to people. But now the, the company has grown and, um, you know, we're able to hire uh, many more people uh, to work full-time on a flexible basis. They're actually earning much more than whatever they were working when they were, you know, were, uh, working full-time. Uh, so one of them is Yamama. I'm really, um, you know, she's a, she's a great friend. Um, she actually studied architecture in Syria and then came to Bulgaria with her family, uh, but couldn't continue her studies. Um, so in the beginning, you know, she had uh, been working kind of without a contract as a teacher and so on. Um, but for her, it was really difficult to either, to either continue her studies or try to find an employment. So we were kind of her first employer. And then afterwards, uh, she went on to work in a customer service position. Uh, and now she's still working with us part time um, as a freelancer and uh, at the other job. And it's really great. You know, she's uh, she's progressed a lot and uh, we still keep in touch. Um, so, yeah, that's one story. Uh, another one is um, of uh, Hiba. Uh, she is an Iraqi lady. Uh, she has three kids, I think. Um, so, you know, for her, it was a challenge uh, to find a job that would allow her to also care for her children and, you know, her household. So um, she's amazing because she's the most hardworking person I've ever met. Um, always, you know, whenever she's done with her work, she always messages me and she's like, hey, Eva, is there more work? Any more projects? I'm available just so that you know. Um, so, yeah, she's one of the highest earners, the top earners at the company. And uh, we've, she's been working with us as a freelancer since 2018. So, um, yeah, we're really, really happy with her. And one thing that she recently shared, because she's on one of the projects that is, you know, the, the highest earning and also the longest. Um, and she said that she's actually donating part of the money that she earns every month uh, through that project. And she thinks that this is the reason why, you know, this project has been so uh, continuing for so long. Oh, wow. Hard work pays off. Yeah. Really, it does. Uh, have you inspired any of the, the refugees that you've worked with to start their own entrepreneurial journey? Um, I think they don't actually need me for inspiration. Uh, you know, a lot of them are very entrepreneurial. A lot of people, I mean, you probably have seen here in Sofia, all the Arab shops and, and uh, you know, places for food and so on. Barber and a shops. Lot of people, yeah, barber shops. Um, so people are so entrepreneurial and, uh, you know, a lot of 
um, the the businesses uh, that are here are actually, you know, especially in the Arab Quarter, are um, led by refugees. Um, so it's really great. They don't need me for inspiration. Um, there was one guy, actually, in the beginning, we organized a hackathon when I was uh, just starting out and, you know, trying to energize the community here in, in Sofia. Um, and there was this guy from Gambia, Musa. Uh, he's also amazing because, you know, we were trying to assemble at the hackathon. The idea was to create so technical solutions for the refugee crisis. And we were assembling teams of programmers and refugees who could um, contribute to creating tools and, and platforms for this. Um, and basically, Musa came and he was both a refugee and a programmer. And he created an entire project on his own. Um, and yeah, it was amazing because afterwards he actually built this platform. It was like a donations platform so that people could donate things directly to refugees instead of going through like NGOs and stuff. Um, and he actually created it. He registered his own business. Right now he's in China, actually. So uh, he's not maintaining the platform so actively, but he was a great example of, you know, a refugee entrepreneur. So a hidden gem. Yeah. Awesome. What does it take to build a sustainable company in the social sphere, something that has a social impact? Um, Just like humans in the loop. I think it, it's the same thing that um, enables any business to be sustainable. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's social or not. Um, you know, with social businesses, we have the additional difficulty of making the impact sustainable. So we not only have to think about making the, the actual business work in a sustainable way, but also tying our impact to the business objectives, making sure that they are aligned and making sure that as our business grows, our impact grows in the same way or even in a more exponential way than that. Um, so I would say it just takes, you know, the regular things of, of making sure you have, you know, predictable revenue, predictable expenses, a clear strategy of, of scaling those up and, and uh, setting, you know, the clear processes to make it happen so that it's independent from, you know, the, the actual entrepreneur or, or the, even the, the uh, individuals on the team. Through the stories that you've shared, it looks like you're very empathic and leading with this empathy. Um, is empathy something that gets you together and makes people like more calm and happy? Yeah, definitely. There is, uh, I mean, the element of empathy is really core to what we do. Uh, but I would say I'm even too empathetic. Uh, I need, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the good cop and I need a bad cop in order to make things happen because especially in the social sphere, you know, a lot of people who are, let's say, vulnerable or uh, who uh, have, you know, been receiving some kind of aid from non-governmental organizations and so on, um, they might lack the internal kind of motivation to uh, do hard work, to act in a professional way, just because, you know, they're, they, they haven't been in the labor market for so long, or maybe they ha don't have the necessary experience. Um, so, of course, through this empathy, we're making sure that we're providing them with the conditions that they need in order to work. So, for example, okay, you're a woman, you have, you know, your household, your family, we can provide you with this opportunity to work in a flexible way whenever you want, wherever you want, uh, but you still have to prove to us that you're serious about this, that you're going to respect your deadlines, you know, that you're going to be, um, you know, that you're going to deliver high quality work. Um, so through this, you know, other perspective, we're actually making sure that uh, people are treated with dignity as actual employees. You know, we're not giving handout, handouts to anybody. Um, you know, you have to deserve the money that you earn. Um, so, yeah, I think there are two sides of this and we want to avoid becoming too empathetic because sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, you didn't manage to finish your project. That's fine. I understand you have your own conditions and, you know, your, your environment and so on. But um, that's not always good for the person themselves either. Yeah. So it's not about giving people fish, but learning them how to fish. Yeah. Uh, you're only 27 year old, so you're so young and uh, this optimistic way of looking into human relations is something that um, I've personally experienced. What is your way of um, learning how to say no? Because uh, being empathetic, but knowing when to say no can uh, make uh, the partnership between a good cop and a bad cop absolutely unnecessary. So you can still be the good cop that sometimes says no. 
Yeah, it's all about being fair and just rather than being good necessarily because being good sometimes creates you know negative consequences. Um, so I definitely agree. I still have a hard time saying no sometimes, uh, but it's mostly out of self-preservation. You know, a lot of people have a hard time saying no whenever there are like clients coming to them and they're asking them for a lot of services that they might not, you know, they they might not be standard, for example, for what they're offering. Um, so sometimes, you know, as you're starting out, of course, you're you would sacrifice anything for a client, you know. So. Um, learning to say no to clients and sorry, that doesn't really fit with what we are offering is a hard step uh, for any entrepreneur. But I think this is one example of, you know, knowing your priorities, knowing where to focus on. And this um, can also be relevant for just yourself as a person and, and your time and your priorities. So I guess, you know, it's a matter of growing up. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, the, the good thing about growing up is hopefully learning how to say no. When we're saying yes to something good, we are saying no to something great. Yeah. So which part of running this um, social impact business uh, do you enjoy the most? Mm, I would say the diversity, because as a CEO, you have to do everything, right? Or you have to know how everything works. And in the beginning, especially I was the, you know, the jack of all trades or the, the human orchestra, as you see in Bulgarian. Or Shiva. Um, yeah. Shiva. Yeah, and or the lady Shiva with, with many, uh, many hands. Um, so this was really enjoyable for me personally, you know, because um, I didn't have any professional experience before that. So um, I had to like learn everything from accounting to contracts to sales and marketing to uh, hiring people and social impact and measuring it. And uh, it's just very stimulating. Um, and this is something that I still enjoy up to this day. Um, so I would say this is one of the best parts of it. Right now, I'm kind of, you know, thinking more on the strategic level of uh, the impact of our company. Uh, I'm collaborating with our chief impact officer that we now have. Um, and I'm thinking also about the ethical impact of what we're doing, not only on the people that we're working with, but also on the systems that we're building in terms of, you know, the AI models that we're training through our work and so on. So it's really great that, you know, now I am I can take a little bit of break of all the day-to-day -day work and actually uh, take some time to think about these big questions. Being so young and seeing how much effort you've put into this company, did you manage to find your personal uh, recipe for balanced life? That's a good question. Uh, it took me a while. Uh, definitely during the first two years, it was really hard to take a break because it was only me, right? So I was the bottleneck of the whole company. Everything depended on me and every single decision or action. Um, so, of course, I just couldn't afford to take a break, you know, um, the company would have stopped if I would, if I stopped as well. Um, so I think it, I guess it's, it's normal, you know, in these first um, few years of the company, but now it's, it's much better, you know, having a team that you can rely on and, um, yeah, uh, also focusing much more on family. Um, I actually regret very much. You know, in the first year while I was working on the company, I had just arrived back from university and I was at home with my family and I would be stuck, you know, to the laptop the whole time. And they would try to like make small talk with me and, and ask me things. And I would be so uninterested in anything that didn't have to do with the business. And I regret this so much because now, you know, I've moved out. I don't spend that much time with them. Um, so it's actually so many opportunities missed for, you know, being with them and spending time. Uh, so now I'm, I'm really trying to think about, you know, all of the other aspects of my life and remembering that, you know, the company is not me and I'm not the company, uh, which is a, a hard realization for any, you know, solo founder. Um, and that there are so many other things in my life besides the company and beyond it. We people are very um, uninterested in getting wisdom about such things in life, like, okay, my family is just next to me and I'm stuck on my games or my company or whatever I, I found more interesting or more important at the moment. Um, but this is the price we have to pay sometimes. And there's always a price that we have to pay uh, to get this, uh, this knowledge and realization. Um, what keeps you going 
because you seem to be so enthusiastic into sharing what has happened in the last four years uh, and how you managed to grow from one person to how many people are there in the now? Mm, around 10. Around 10, course. working with how many refugees? Mm, 350. Wow. So tell me more about what fuels your fire. Yeah, well, in the beginning, it was just this inevitability of just having to push this forward because, you know, it had to happen. You know, I was just the vehicle through which it, it had to become a reality. And now it's more of, you know, this is already built. There are so many people depending on it. Uh, there are so many people that are waiting for work in this very moment. We have to act and we have to try to make it grow as fast as possible and as big as possible so that all of these people that are in need of, of such types of work um, can, can receive it. So I think right now it's just, you know, this enormous pressure that I feel my shoulders of, wow, you know, we have to be constantly working. Um, and of course, it's, it's just the business model that we have in which we're securing the clients uh, one by one. Instead of creating a marketplace or some sort, we're the ones who are client facing, we're always interacting with them and so on. Uh, instead of connecting clients with um, freelancers, for example, which would be much more scalable, but then, uh, you know, there would be so many challenges of actually um, the quality, the execution of these the large scale projects. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for now, we've decided that we need to be this management layer. Maybe in the future, this is something that we can do in order to also remove ourselves from the equation and create just a marketplace where people can be connected with each other. And um, I've, I've recently been very inspired by this idea of cooperatives. So training refugees to self-manage themselves in like a cooperative that delivers mm. this or that type of service. Uh, but it's really hard, you know, because it's, it's much easier to be an employee and to receive a given project, to work on it, and then receive payment. It's a whole other game uh, to actually get out there, start securing clients and talk to them. It's, it's really difficult. Um, so for now, we're facilitating this process. Maybe in the future, we'll try to step away. Imagine that humans in the loop have already made this platform that you're uh, you were just describing and tomorrow you need to start another thing what would it be oh wow um i've never actually thought of that i've been you know so focused on what i'm doing right now i don't even have you know how there are a lot of people that just have plenty of ideas for businesses and they're constantly inspired like oh this could be a business and this could be a business i'm i never like that i'm just focused so much on what i'm building right now that i'm not even um considering any other alternatives or thinking about what else i could be doing you know it's just um, my only focus right now how do you keep this laser focus active i think i'm just not it, it takes um a lot to make me passionate so I can't just become passionate uh, with an idea or an, an inspiration of some sort or just something that I saw. You know, it, it takes really a lot to uh, get me committed. And, and right now I am, you know, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a matter of your threshold, I think, of, of getting enthusiastic about something. Yeah, I don't, I don't smell the fear of missing out in you in any way. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you were... You were explaining how the refugees basically work. They're helping the algorithms of AI and uh, machine learning uh, improve manually. Um, in, do you think in 10 years time, the society will still be needing human labor to help algorithms perform better? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because essentially what we're doing now is labeling the training data so that these algorithms can you know, learn how to recognize objects or classify images or whatever it is uh, related to computer vision. So essentially, once we perform the training uh, of the model through the manually labeled data, we're not longer needed. So we're working to automate our own work. We're basically, you know, excavating our own grave. Um, so a lot of people feel like this is something that's doomed to become obsolete and, you know, in the future there will be no need for it. It's also a very 
unsexy type of work. You know, the machine learning industry relies so much on it, but nobody appreciates it that much. Everybody tries to avoid it, to uh, avoid these costs that come with it, uh, and to design models that are able to train with much less training data and so on. So we, we definitely take this into account, uh, but my vision is that um, there is actually another stage of the process where our people will be much more needed, and that's after the model has been trained, there has to be human oversight on how it performs. So, you know, if I'm trying to classify, I don't know, people, um, there has to be human oversight on at least some part of that um, on those, you know, predictions that are being generated by the AI and to make sure that, okay, is this model actually biased against certain type of people? Um, and to make sure that we are correcting these things uh, and these outputs and also providing insights on what needs to be done because there is always, you know, model drift and um, the data is changing, the models are get getting outdated. So this type of continuous maintenance for the models is going to get much more important in the future. Right now, almost nobody's thinking about it. A lot of companies are just focused on training their models, uh, but keeping them up to date in the future, I think, is going to be a big business for us. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere. How did this idea of introducing uh, people in, in social need and such a high level of technology like AI and machine learning came to your mind. How do you end up having the idea, okay, I will um, find people that really can do this and I will find companies that really need this human labor to be done. I mean, it's you're connecting things from like different worlds. I know. It's super great. It's a really great niche that we were able to locate. Um, oh. Yeah, it was. Uh, it actually started as a whole other idea of uh, having people perform uh, trainings for sustainability. There was this uh, social enterprise back in New York that I met, um, and they were doing some really great things, again, for underprivileged youth. So I was very inspired by that model. And then uh, I took a lot of inspiration from other companies. There is this company in Cambodia called Digital Divide Data. They uh, have a similar model in which um, they uh, provide data entry services and transcription services. So I was like, wow, maybe this can be useful. Um, and in the beginning, I was actually thinking that a big part of what we do would be transcribing Arabic scripts, just because OCR for Arabic is not that advanced yet. So I was thinking, wow, what would be, um, you know, the way in which we can digitize Arabic heritage and documents and the historical like archives and uh, library information uh, from Arabic? You know, all of these people can can be involved in this. Um, so that was one of the ideas that I was exploring. And then, you know, data, data entry, some companies were offering something called data annotation. And I was like, hmm, what would my dad be? Um, so I, I just remember talking to one of my professors at Columbia and he, uh, he was very skeptical about the library idea. You know, he was like, oh, don't get into that market. It's really difficult to sell things to libraries. You know, they're the, the, the flow of time is just very slow, as you can imagine. Um, it's going to be very, very hard. But see, this thing about the data annotation, try to look into it more. You know, it's AI is, is growing now, you know, so if you guys can get plugged in there, that's going to be great. So I guess it was just, you know, finding this niche. And right now it's been great because of the, the market has grown so much. There are actually so many companies that used to be like traditional business process outsourcing, maybe transcribing invoices and uh, doing data entry. Right now, all of them have profiled themselves as data annotation companies, also because they are seeing the menace of the automation of their own work. Um, there are also a lot of big call centers that are realizing, wow, we're going to have to participate in this market because otherwise our workforce will remain without any uh, work opportunities, you know, with the advent of chatbots and uh, assistants and so on. So I think a lot of companies are realizing that they just have to participate in this revolution instead of, you know, trying to stay on, on float with uh, the old business models. We have an outlier here. Imaga is a great example of a, a software for uh, that uses machine learning to identify objects, yeah. which is amazing. Imaga was actually our first client. Awesome. Yeah, I got connected with Georgi, the CEO, um, a while ago, back in 2017. And 
he was like, how did you even find out about this industry? This is, we do have this need. I don't, don't, have no idea how you found out about this. Um, so we did a, a pilot with them in the beginning of 2018. And since then they have been really great. They have supported us so much. I still remember one thing that Yuri told me, which was, you know, the best way to support the startup is to become its client, you know, not to give it funding or anything else, because, you know, by, by having a startup actually deliver results and, and performing services, you're going to help it clear out the, its entire processes. And um, yeah, so working with them has been really great. And he's been kind of, you know, even a, a mentor to me. And I really appreciate all of their help. Awesome. Um, you sounded like you uh, pivoted a bit to get the idea straight. And then the, this advice that you gave uh, passed down from Georgi Kadrev was uh, become a startup's client instead of uh, provided with, with funding. Um, are there other ways to encourage founders, uh, social or other type of um, entrepreneurship in endeavors uh, to look for? Um, well, I think definitely at the very early stages, funding is, is crucial. I remember it was very hard for us to get our first funding. Um, it was this course that we organized with the Red Cross for refugees. Uh, and we got like something like 3,000 3, leva from it. So 1,500 euros. And it was so important for me to get this funding. You know, I organized an entire course. I led it all by myself. Uh, it was like five weeks, six hours per day, you know, really intense course. This is how we got our first employees. Um, but I actually remember, you know, it was so important to me. And at one point they called me and they said, Hey, we might have to cancel this. I'm really sorry. Whatever. I don't even remember what had happened. Uh, and I was in some park and I just sat down and started crying. You know, this is the first and last time that I've cried about the business. Um, but you know, for me, it was just like, uh, the, this first funding that was so crucial so that, uh, we could start, um, working. Um, and we could become operational. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's almost nothing. What can you buy with 1,500 euros in terms of like operational capital or anything like that? Um, so the fact that we, we didn't have a lot of funding actually made us more frugal. Um, so we, uh, instead of getting some funding to buy computers, for example, we just went out and asked for donations. Uh, we tried to find like a, an office within uh, an IT uh, training center. So, you know, it was cheaper. Uh, there were so many organizations that helped us either with like donations or mm. just like materials and so on. So it made us, I guess, you know, a little bit, um, yeah, more frugal, trying to think of ways in which we can still get all of these resources that we needed to start without any of the funding um, so I guess you know funding is great but also yeah pushing startups to be resourceful and um, to be very careful about what they're spending their first funding on this is also something very important another thing that in my personal opinion is important is uh, persistence so is there anything that you have ever quit uh, in your life because it sounds like you have the idea and you go and you find a way. Yeah. What a um, go-getter that we have. Yeah, I'm not sure I've quit anything like business related. I had to quit belly dancing uh, because I used to be, I used to dance a lot when I was in the States. And uh, when I came back home, I I also, you know, tried to, to uh, continue dancing here with a group. Uh, but it was such a hard time. You know, I wasn't earning any salary. I was... Uh, you know, in those first stages of the business where we really, you know, weren't having a lot of clients in the beginning. I was, you know, having suleti for lunch every day just because I couldn't go uh, to a, like a normal restaurant or have anything else. Um, and then, yeah, I, it was just very hard because I was participating with this belly dance group at like concerts and stuff like that. And they, uh, we had to buy like a lot of the uh, costumes and, and dresses. Uh, so I was like, sorry, I, I have to quit. Um, so this was, you know, just a, a sacrifice of what I really enjoyed doing just because I wasn't able to um, participate at that point. Um, and also, I think there was a factor of, uh, you know, I'm 
trying to portray, you know, this professional image towards the people that I'm working with, but belly dancing, like Oriental dances have a completely different, you know, kind of connotation towards them, both here in Bulgaria and in the Arab world. So me, you know, going out and, and doing, you know, be belly dancing uh, at night, you know, as a secret <laughs> second life, um, just didn't seem like something that would be a good fit. So yeah, I, I think this is one of the things that I've, I've quit. So how do you find joy and fun in your life if you've quit something that like basically provides you with this? Yeah, I mean, afterwards I did continue dancing, like Latin American dances, I, uh, I already mentioned, you know, Latin America is a big love for me. So yeah, I'm still dancing, just other types of dances. Um, and then, yeah, I, I have this uh, garden Uh, and it's like a community garden that I go to uh, with my husband and it's really great. It's like labor therapy, you know, um, just like digging and sewing stuff and taking care of your plants and so on. It's actually really great for mental health. Awesome. Um, we have the recursive question. It's a question that is being passed down through previous guests. And the question that uh, the guest before you Uh, not knowing that you are uh, you're coming next on the podcast gave us <laughs> is how can we create a business or how can a person create a business in the most human like way hmm. yeah i i think this is a great fit for me i i, I know that the person didn't know who was coming next but lucky guess yeah um well i would say that you know how Every business has to have metrics. Um, it has to have it have it its north star metric, like other metrics that they're constantly reporting on. They're trying to optimize. So having those metrics actually be human centered is key, I think. So right now, for example, what we're reporting on is how many people do we have active? How many? How much? Uh, work are they receiving? How many projects per month? How much are they earning on average? You know, all of these things. Uh, we're measuring satisfaction, of course. So, you know, of course, in order to provide them with work, we have to secure clients. Um, but, you know, the fact that we're reporting on the salaries of these people and how many workers we have makes us also, for example, prioritize certain clients that are going to give us more work for our people instead of prioritizing clients who can just, you know, pay us a big sum of money for something that maybe doesn't even involve our people, maybe for another type of service. So it helps us stay focused on services that are really going to serve our workers. So I guess um, choosing metrics that are tied to a human uh, and that are human -centric, um, centric is key. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, what would be your recursive question to the next, the next guest? Yeah, well, I've been recently um, trying to recruit people for my team and it's always a big struggle, you know, especially for a social enterprise, um, trying to find people who are both top notch, you know, top talents and highly skilled superstars. and also yeah, superstars. superstars. And also, you know, they're willing to work for a social enterprise for maybe, you know, a lower salary and they're motivated by the social mission rather than the money. And, um, you know, maybe they're willing to work for a company that is in its early stages. It's not that easy. Um, so I guess my question would be about um, how do you recruit really great talent and get them motivated and inspired um, for your project, you know, whether it's your business or how do you galvanize people around you and, and yeah, how do you recruit? I guess it's like a couple of sub questions, uh, but yeah, I'd really love to hear their opinion on that. Awesome. Um, Eva, what would you like to be remembered for? I don't know. Um, I guess I I don't usually think about that because being remembered for something is more about like PR and what your PR was instead of who you actually were and uh, what you actually did. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, this PR um, is all about your professional life and the image that you're portraying instead of who you actually are in, you know, um, as a person. So, um I guess, you know, I just want to be remembered by the people who are close to me, who you know who I really am. 
um, I'm not really sure I want to be remembered by like everybody else based on like the the PR that we 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 have to do. You know, as a, as a founder, you always have to put yourself out there and to be super active and to be sharing things and you know representing the company and everything else. And a lot of people love that type of like heropreneurship and the uh, the idea of the the founder. You know, as uh, this really. Uh, interesting and magnetic figure or whatever. So sometimes you just have to embody these for the benefit of your business. But I'm not sure I want to be remembered in this uh, in this image because that's not necessarily who I really am. You've already mentioned that you started Humans in the Loop with no money. And in the beginning, it was very hard to find any funding. Um, is this the biggest challenge for social enterprises? Securing money, finding funding? I think it's more about making the strategic decision, knowing what to do with money when it comes to you, um, because a lot of social enterprises might um, receive funding from other like EU programs or grants or, you know, even through their earned revenue and so on. Um, but knowing what to do with this money, how to invest it so that it grows even more, there is this return on investment instead of, you know, just spending it to cover your expenses. Um, I think this is the key and a lot of social enterprises, including ours in the beginning, we just didn't know where to invest that money. We didn't also have a lot of money to invest, but, you know, um, we were kind of stuck in a cycle where we were covering our daily expenses, but that was it. Uh, we didn't have, um, we weren't spending part of that money for improvements. Um, so I guess uh, providing startups with this expertise and uh, strategic planning on how to manage their finances, it's even more crucial than giving them money. You've already mentioned frugality. Now you're mentioning financial wisdom. So is there anything else on finances that uh, any social entrepreneur should take into account prior to starting or in the beginning of the process? Well, for me, it was this realization that you actually have to be monitoring your finances constantly. You know, at one point I was just, you know, stuck doing the business and um, I wasn't paying attention a lot. I was looking at the bottom line and how much we have in the bank, of course, but I wasn't really doing the analysis of what we're spending, how we're spending it, um, where could, you know, these um, investments be optimized or uh, the expenses, how can they be cut? Um, so, you know, ever since I started monitoring uh, the everything on a monthly or even, you know, shorter basis, it really gave me an idea of how the business is, is going forward. Um, I think in the beginning I was just avoiding it because I wasn't sure whether I was going to like it or not. Uh, but you have to face the truth, you know, and you have to really know everything about your, the, your finances. And, and especially with startups, it's like just... Um, plus and minus, you know, you don't have very complex financial calculations or anything else like that. It's just money in, money out. So you have to be in control of that fully. You're mentioning something that's um, quite, quite an important tactics uh, to own on the process. You have this ownership of what's happening in your finances and in generally in the, in the startup. Um, in our part of Europe, it's always someone else to blame. So someone is not providing me with, uh, the clients don't understand, uh, my employees, the people that I work with cannot do their job. So how did you manage to develop this mindset about, okay, I, I'm here and I own it and I, you did it for two years? I think it was the question of there not being anybody else. Um, of course, there are the external actors to blame, you know, the, nobody understands me and, and people just don't get it. Um, but also the fact that I couldn't rely on anybody else. Mm. Now that the team is expanding and we have some really great uh, members on the team, it's a matter of um, transmitting this to them and trusting them to own their part of the process. Uh, which has been hard, you know, I'm uh, usually it's very hard to earn my trust and I'm very distrustful just because I've been owning these processes for so long. Um, so for me to let go and to trust you for managing this or that part of the business takes a while, maybe around a year um, for me to fully let go. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, 
reliability is is key for me uh, for everybody on the team um, to make sure that I can really trust them and and I really am lucky to have a bunch of really great people. There's a cultural story in our um, Bulgarian heritage about the three sons that uh, were sent to the village with a cart and their father told them if the uh, the cart breaks down you need to uh, shout for the what's how is it in English I have no idea I okay. don't think it exists uh, maybe the like unwill <laughs> the unwill yeah someone someone to help you and um when the sons returned, the father asked them what happened. And they said, um, we were calling, but no one came. So we fixed the cart and on, you were on your own. You basically, there was, there were no brothers. You had to do it on your own. Uh, but for me, it's absolutely true. You need to own, own the entire process. Um, let's, let's go back a bit from a tiny Bulgaria, like a, approximately like 7 million people to one of the biggest um, c cities in the world, New York and the Ivy League. Um, did you choose Columbia University or it chose you? Because the Ivy League is like the best of the best in, in education, like higher education in the world. Um, I definitely chose it. Uh, at first, I remember actually um, when I was in 11th grade, you know, kind of thinking about what to do with my life after I graduated from high school. I remember my father telling me, oh, try to stay in Bulgaria, you know, this would be good. So this was my plan. Um, but then, you know, uh, I was planning to apply for the American University in Blagograd and uh, they needed, you know, the SATs and essays, basically everything that uh, universities in the U.S. need. So I was like, OK, you know, I'm doing this anyways. Why not also submit my application to the States without relying on anything? Because I knew that I would only be able to go with a full scholarship. You know, I wouldn't be able to afford it at all uh, otherwise. Um, so it turned out that they did accept me. Um, and for me, it was really hard to say no and to just reject um, this opportunity. But it was definitely a conscious decision of, OK, I'm going. Um, and, you know, in, in Latin America, because I used to have a lot of friends from there at that point, and they always have um, this mistrust of, of the U.S. They always call them uh, Gringolandia. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, am I actually going to Gringolandia? Uh, <laughs> Um, and it was uh, it was really um, really strange, you know, being there. Um, but I definitely learned uh, a lot. Why do you choose human rights? Yeah, good question. I actually so at first I wanted to study something related to international relations and political science, but then political science in the states um, it sucks. You know, they only study a lot of these like political science theories um, and um, it, it's a very U.S. centric mindset um, and, and theory. So I really didn't enjoy it. And I thought uh, nobody in my political science classes had any critical thinking at all. Um, and then I actually started taking classes on modern history. Uh, I took one class with Rashid Khalidi, who is like this really uh, great uh, scholar of Middle Eastern history, modern Middle Eastern history. Uh, he's a disciple of Edward Said, who is also this really uh, amazing professor who used to uh, teach at Columbia. So the class with him was amazing. It was really eye-opening about, you know, the, the current situation of the Middle East and all of the uh, recent uh, history ever since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, of, of the whole region and the role of colonialism. Uh, and it was it was just so amazing to be studying uh, this type of history because it actually teaches you a lot about politics in a real life way. Uh, also, very frequently from alternative perspectives that just the U.S. one. Uh, so I wanted to study history and I started taking like history classes and so on. And my family was like, what are you doing? Are you going to be a history professor or something? Uh, they didn't see any utility at all uh, in that. So in the end... Um, I was also thinking, okay, you know, graduating with a liberal arts history degree is nice, but then it's true, you know, um, yeah, you have to be very resourceful about what to do next with it afterwards uh, and how to display it in a way that makes sense to employers. 
So in the end, I said, okay, what I really care about is, you know, this human rights aspect. And um, also the human rights department was very flexible in terms of what classes you could count towards satisfying the major requirements. So I basically took all of my uh, weird classes that I had taken from weird disciplines and I declared all of these are like human rights related. So this is how I, I ended up with this degree. At the end of the day, you didn't need any employer. Yeah, true. So <laughs> I shouldn't have cared that much. Um, how does a young person find what uh, he or she likes? Because um, what, what kind of questions do you because, give yourself in order to clarify the path in life that you want to take or at least test? Mm. Uh, I have a friend of mine that says the questions are the steering wheel of the mind. What uh, kind of questions did you uh, ask yourself or what kind of questions would you recommend for others that are searching for their own ways? Mm. Asking yourself, what are the opportunities in front of me? Um, because sometimes we're kind of blind to what is out there. Um, and then how can I go as deep as possible in something that I'm interested in? So, for example, I was very passionate about uh, Panama. Uh, at one point I was doing some um, human rights research into their dictatorship. Uh, so I even traveled there with some university funding. I did like, I became, you know, this uh, human rights activist and researcher at the age of, like 20. Um, and it was it was definitely too much. I was definitely not prepared to handle it. To handle it, I didn't do a good job at all. Uh, but at least you know it was an opportunity that I had in front of me. It was an interest that I had, uh, and I just ended up meeting people and and getting into this. Um, so it actually became this really interesting project of mine that I dedicated so much time to. Um, and suddenly, you know, you become more and more professionalized. You get to meet more and more people from this industry and make the connections and the networking and you start interpreting it from your own perspective. So anything can become a vocation and anything can, uh, become like an entire sphere where you can develop yourself and become, you know, the best of the best, um, and, and an expert, you know, for example, data labeling, I never thought that I would be getting into it, but, you know, right now I'm, I'm in a position where I know a lot about the industry. I can actually interpret it from my own lens and through my own values and my mission and try to think about how to make the whole industry much more ethical. Um, so I guess it's about, you know, pinpointing an opportunity and just getting deep into it, trying to, you know, do it your way. And, um, yeah, you're going to be surprised at, you know, what levels you're able to reach. You learned the business on the go. Uh, what did you find out about your strong sides prior to creating the organization? Uh, something from your past that really helped you, uh, through your, um, first steps in the first two years of creating your own company. Yeah, I think it was all of the extracurriculars. Um, you know, back in Granada during my study abroad year, I uh, volunteered with an organization working with uh, sex workers and prostitutes. Uh, and we organized some events and like a big academic conference. Um, and, you know, being behind such an event, you have to talk to a lot of stakeholders and to, you know, try to secure funding. And it's basically like a small enterprise that you're working on, even if it's just like one, a one-off event. Um, so all of these skills uh, for communication, for branding and marketing and, you know, for attracting the right people and doing all that networking, um, those are so helpful. Those are much more helpful than, you know, kind of the, the more dry skills or more technical skills that you're learning in your classes at university. So I guess, you know, all of these volunteering activities, NGOs, um, yeah, other um, clubs that you're part of, sports activities, anything, you know, that has to do with teamwork, leadership. You actually learn so much uh, through these things and they give you so much. I didn't realize it before I actually mm -hmm. started working on this business and, and seeing how these were playing out. So hands-on is the right approach. Yeah. You've been part of the presidency in Bulgaria and also the United Nations. What was your experience with uh, joining some of really like representative organizations such as these two? Yeah, well, these were internships. These were just summer internships. And nevertheless, 
they were very useless. I mean, I, I am happy to, you know, be able to speak about that, frankly, nothing <laughs> against the institutions. Um, but, you know, in a lot of cases, young people were just trying to get experience, you know, they're trying to have something to mm. put on their CVs and they're getting in touch with these institutions. And in a lot of cases, it's just um, uh, very useless. You're not contributing to the organization at all. They don't know what to do with you. You're just this intern without any experience. Um, they keep you at, at side, you know, at bay because they don't want to give you anything that's actually important for them. Um, and in the end, you don't learn a lot. Um, and it feels like time lost on both sides. Uh, except for, you know, at the end, they give you a certificate that you've completed an internship with them and you can finally put it on your LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, right now, for example, we're working with interns at the Humes and Loop and what I'm doing is really giving them all of the practical work that's related. For example, if it's for marketing, you're in charge of social media, just go ahead and, you know, of course, we're communicating about what you're doing, but, you know, get out there try to do things that are beneficial for the company, you know, take control. Even though you're an intern, I trust you fully. Uh, you don't have to be like, you know, bringing coffee to anybody or doing stuff like that. You are actually part of the team. What would be your advice to um, yourself looking for internship if you could go back in time? Um, well, I think it was not such a bad step to get into those places because of course, when, when you don't have any experience, you're trying to find the most prestigious place that you can put on your CV. But definitely I would say that my work, for example, with the Spanish NGO, uh, that, you know, it's not famous or anything, but it exposes you, for example, to a collective that, uh, not a lot of people have access to or, uh, communicates with, you know, uh, sex workers in Spain, for example, and a lot of them were foreigners and we would go to the brothels and, and talk to them. And, uh, this was such an amazing experience much more useful than you know just being at the at the presidency here and and trying to think you know what what i can be um useful with and maybe drafting a report or two for the internal use of no the contribution yeah yeah i see awesome for me uh, personal life is uh was a great enabler in my personal career last couple of years uh, how important it is to find someone that's not only intellectually supportive, but also um, inspires you to do better, to do more. So what's the, what's the, the hidden role of the, the partner in life that uh, enables people to, to do better, according to your personal opinion? Yeah, well... Behind, you know, this front line, front line story of what's happening on a professional level and so on, there's a personal story. And um, a lot of the decisions that I've actually taken are prompted by personal situations, you know, different people in my life. And uh, this is so true for so many people, you know, when you're tracking a person's professional life story, a lot of the uh, cases in which they have moved from one country to another or switched jobs or taken a particular decision, it's, it's very front, frequently uh, prompted by, you know, personal life. Um, so for me, it was the same, you know, that gap year that I took uh, in order to be with my then boyfriend, now husband, um, afterwards, you know, part of the decision to come back to Bulgaria was the fact that, you know, we were thinking, okay, where in the world should we meet? Because, um, he's Moroccan, he was, uh, living in Spain, but I'm Bulgarian, you know, living in, in the U.S. Should we just pinpoint one country and try to be there together? Uh, so we chose Bulgaria and he was, you know, kind enough to, to make this step, uh, and, and to try to come here. It took him a whole year. Uh, you know, with the Moroccan passport, trying to uh, come here and try to find employment, which is, you know, he's working in the sustainability sector, solar energy, renewables and so on. Uh, and it was hard, you know, because it's not that like this industry is very well developed here. There are just a, a small bunch of companies that are working in this. Um, but yeah, he's been really a major factor in uh, a lot of the things that I've uh, chosen as a focus. You know, my, my interest in the Middle East was definitely related to my relationship with him, me trying to take up Arabic as well, and, you know, just trying to find a way to communicate with his family. 
Um, so, you know, we're not two separate entities, you know, the professional and the personal one. We're one whole and it's all in, a, in an interplay. So for me, it has been so interesting and so inspiring and just uh, it has been so fruitful to have him by my side and to uh, bounce ideas off of each other. And uh, he's had such a major role in, in everything that I've built. Awesome. I hope that more people um, think in the way of um, spreading their worldview uh, when touching toward, uh, uh, touching uh, touching base with someone else from with another cultural or historical uh, uh, background, because um, opening to others uh, can make um, can can make us more successful in anything that we do. My my girlfriend has spent time into. <laughs> my fiance has spent time in uh, uh, Tunis, in mm -hmm. Tunisia. She was part of um, this group called IFAC. They were francophone organizations supporting people in Tunisia. And she mentioned that on our first date. And knowing that she did uh, the Ramadan with the people that she was staying with to uh, represent her respect towards their tradition, and culture and drinking water only in her own room where no one can see her uh, out of respect it was really um, an amazing way to understand that someone respects others and would like I was really getting interested into this person's um, um, mindset about life and here we go six years after so uh, I absolutely support you in, um, in in the way you thought about this partnership that's fruitful it's always uh, for me, it's a great it's a great way to to learn more. Having another person that's having a different uh, view towards our problems and uh, having their support. So thank you for being on the recursive podcast, Eva. It was great having you here. Uh, thank you for sharing us so much about the story about humans in the loop, about the importance of uh, human rights and sustainable social businesses. Uh, thank you for being with us in this uh, episode of the Recursive Podcast. Uh, I was the host, Georgi Nenov, and my guest today was Ivo Gumnishka. So, see you around next time. Tune in next week for the sixth episode of the Recursive Podcast. Irina talks to the co-founder of image recognition company MAGA and health tech startup Kelvin Health, Georgi Kudrev. In its um, mission, and uh, I would use... Um, a uh, quote by Bogumil Balkanski, Bogi, well known, I guess, as well in the Bulgarian ecosystem. Uh, and not only, so he said, a lot of people are asking me, should I pursue a professional career or starting a startup? And um, he, I mean, he said, I am telling them, um, there are no rational reasons to start a startup. You can make much more money you know, if you climb the corporate ladder the right way. Of course, if you have the skills and the qualities, the only reason to start a startup is to feel that your life will be incomplete if you don't do it. So it's it's as simple and as natural as that. You start a startup because you feel that if you don't do it, you'll be a lesser man to a certain extent or to a huge extent. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.